to uh, What's up? another another edition of Musings with Stephanie and Maria. I'm Stephanie. Maria has Wednesdays and Fridays. We're not going to cast this video to our TV. Um, Maria, if you're out there, can you? There you are. So I, thank you. Um, so I am on the City Museum page, right? I had a little trouble with this last week. Um, yeah, so Musings with Stephanie and Maria is just that. We kind of do some, uh, in fact, Musings in particular with Stephanie is kind of some random thoughts and history and bits and pieces about the museum. Um, many of you, we won't get started just yet, but many of you know that uh, both Maria and I share the distinction of being half of City Museum couples. Both of our husbands are... Um, Day one alumni with City Museum. This is my husband, Mark Von Drasik. Hey. He is a legacy artist with City Museum and we're gonna have some stories today. Um, just a couple of things, but we have, of course, unique viewpoint um, since, well, you think I've been there a long time. He was there from the very beginning, so. We could do a whole episode on city museum <laughs> relationships, but let's not do that today. That may or may not be a good thing to do, but there are several. <laughs> <laughs> there are several uh, successful ones. I'm gonna have to try to remember not to talk over you today, baby. I'm sorry. Anyway, okay, we've got a couple of people out there. Thirty of you, twenty-nine. Hey, who left me? Um, anyway, all right. So, welcome to another episode of Musings with Stephanie and Maria. Um, Maria is my uh, colleague and dear friend at the museum. She is, she um, is the archivist, chief archivist, and um, tours manager. I am the uh, retail director, and I say historian by virtue of tenacity. I've been there a very long time. Um, this is my husband, Mark Von Drasik. He is uh, one of the legacy artists with City Museum, having been there since pre-day one so let's talk about some stories oh look you're watching hey Lori so anyway so we have some stories today um, hi Lori this is so weird because there's a little bit of a, a lull or a lag anyway so let's say we have a we have a little bit of a different perspective than most people because we did like get to live in the building and you got to live there first. But anyway, so how did you, how did you get started with Bob? Um, back in the mid eighties, I was, I had been apprenticing to a stone carver for a little over a year. And when she closed her studio, I wanted Sarah to Sturgis. continue doing that. And, uh, I opened the phone book and I went to sculptors and Bob <laughs> Cassidy was the first one let in the in line. So <laughs> I called up and I introduced myself and went down to uh, meet um, Bob and Gail for an interview. Uh, I should say I had been working as a cook through my twenties and the way I got interested in sculpture was through doing ice carvings. So I marched down there with of my pathetic little ice carvings and <laughs> and said I want a job and Bob said well I'm not hiring right now and I said well I'm I'm a cook so I don't go to work till one o'clock and I could come in and sweep up or do anything I can for free just to see what you do here I'm very interested and that would have been at Castley and Castley right that was at Lafayette yeah okay. um no city museum yet and uh so he said well sure that'd be okay and about six weeks later he hired me and uh the rest is history man so at that time they were they were doing the um the reproductions the castings and whatnot yeah we were doing architectural reproductions um i can remember working on the giant squid for the living zoo at, at the St. Louis Zoo. And um, and that's when we started the praying mantis too, was not too long after I started there. I really didn't have much to do with that at all, but 
that was going on when I first started. So that would have been in the what the late the, the mid eighties or the late eighties. Well, I started there in eighty eight. Oh my God. Many of you were not born. Possibly eighty nine, and then ninety, ninety ninety one. I started art school, and. Uh, so you would come back and work in summers and whatnot, sometimes. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. when you weren't at Oxbow. So I started, I went off to art school in Chicago and then came back in 95 and I I, I didn't want to go back to work for Bob. And I got a job <laughs> as a barista at a barble, Barnes and Noble and you can imagine how disastrous that was. So then I thought, well, maybe I ought to go see Bob. And uh, Wait, so why didn't you want to, why didn't you want to go back to work for Bob at that point? I just, I don't know, I just wanted to, I don't know, there wasn't any particular reason. Oh, okay. And uh, I wanted to do my own thing or something, I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Being uh, a barista was not it. Talk about somebody who was not suited for customer service or retail. So in 1995, saying. I went down to see Bob and they were beginning, just beginning on City Museum then. Uh, they were power washing the building top to bottom and taking apart conveyor rollers, conveyor belt systems, all the rollers of which we built the staircases. And uh, and that's when I started. So what did the building look like at that time on the inside? I mean, were there were there still machines and whatnot in there? Yeah, yeah, there were, there was three miles of conveyor system around the building and a lot of, not really a lot of machinery, but yeah. And so, and some of that also got repurposed on on ten for windows, right? That there's a bar up there up there that has uh, the bar in the the small one on the east in the east dining room. Mm -hmm. I thought it was made with one of the machines that was too too busy, too no, big to move or something. Those those bars on the tenth floor were made from the steam pipes that hung on the ceiling when we first went up to renovate the tenth floor. Um, the steam main came into the building and went up to the top and then when they were the steam was distributed down to the floors through various networks to run the factory. Wow. So were all those those pipes cut out and, and used somewhere or are some of them yeah. still there? No, they were too big to get off oh. the 10th floor. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about 18 inch pipe or 6, 14 inch pipe. I mean they're enormous pipes. Huh. Were any of those repurposed for slides anywhere, do you remember? No. Okay. Uh, Pretty much used up on the three bars, or two bars on 10th floor. Wow. So where were we anyway? Okay, so, all right, so we were talking about how you got started with, with Bob, and I also yeah. I see both Maria and Aaron. Um, Aaron, I remember you getting, I remember you calling me Hi, from Aaron. Ohio um, on that Craigslist ad, and I was so excited to hear from you. Um, but yeah, so number one phone book, number one opened it to sculptors. That's pretty funny. So Bob, you know, being as kind as he could be, and he really was very often really kind, it just took me with a grain of salt and thought, yeah, yeah, and he gave me a chance. And uh, when I came back from school, I went to work at the City Museum, and uh, I was working there almost a year. I think it was like, early 96, uh, there was a, an enormous gas leak in the front building. Which and, is the 1509 building that's now the last hotel, right? Yeah, yeah, and they evacuated the buildings, the whole block, and for about 30 hours, I think almost a, maybe, maybe a full day, uh, the fire department and gas company needed access to the entire building and they needed someone to stay open overnight with the keys to make sure they could get where they needed to be and I volunteered because I had already been dying to get a space in the building and uh, then I don't uh, so that all turned out okay the property didn't blow up and after that uh, maybe not it wasn't too long maybe a couple months before other things had come up that they needed someone there and Bob agreed finally to give me a space. So, uh, when I say space, so he, did, he did live there, and I want to show you the luxurious loft space 
that it was living in. I mean, you want to talk about raw loft space, and this would have, this was on what floor? That's on the seventh floor in what is now Earlene's room and the uh, and Mike Green's room. And I didn't have any running water in that space. I was going downstairs to the first floor, what is now the uh, uh, first aid room, and big it really high on the wall. <laughs> so that's where I was and and getting water and things. It's kind of a, a little bit of a history of... I lived there for six months almost in that space. And then moved into the... Fourth floor. Okay. Moved down to four. So, the, yeah. So, for the so the fourth floor and lived there for many years, what is now the, um, the Sullivan Gallery was where you were living when we met and... Sullivan um, Gallery. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah. And where, I mean, and then where we lived for many years after we got married... Um, we lived in what what is now the Sullivan Gallery, um, and it's way fancier now than than when we lived there. Now, when we lived there, it it was better than what I just showed you, but it was still very raw, very uh, very lofty space. But it was neat that we got to live there because you know we, I mean, we were there twenty four hours, of course, and right. many interesting things would come up. Um, you know, you had to tend to various fires and emergency and whatnot, emergencies and such, right? Right. The, the way I paid my rent was to take care of anything and everything that went on after hours at city museums. So there was never any... Back in those days, it was kind of like the Wild West. I mean, I was chasing bums out of the bathrooms and uh, constant fire alarms and police alarm and security alarms and... Uh, people stuck in elevators, elevators not working, garage doors that won't close on a February night when it's 20 below. Uh, yeah, anything and everything. It was really fun. I, it, uh, yeah, it was really good times. I love doing it. We were at home the night the, uh, the night we got the call that somebody lost a finger. Uh, and I don't know how much we can talk about that, but you did find the finger. I ran downstairs <laughs> when I found out what was going on, and um, the girl had been taken away, and uh, yeah, there was commotion searching the it's like stream. like a Friday night, I think. Searching the stream in the caves for the girl's finger, and I happened to go back over to the pig and look at the pig, <laughs> And I found it, it was stuck in the hole where she had put her hand on the pig. I so, shouldn't tell that story. Well, I mean, it is what it is. And then you have, so you have something in common with Timo, who found the other finger that was lost. But, Shh. okay. I mean, sometimes things happen that, you know, people shouldn't be. Let's talk about something else. Um, hey, give anyway. me some feedback. Am I blowing this? <laughs> we would do better with questions and our comments, you know. What do you mean, wow? Okay, wow is good. Wow is a good one. So, um, rooftop. Okay. Can we go there? We can rooftop. go there. You had a good story about something else. Um, I don't remember. I don't remember. There's all kinds of stories, and they just sort of come up. So, the rooftop. Here's kind of an early shot of the rooftop. It doesn't have the, uh, the um, Ferris wheel. Um, hey, Maria. Thank you. Um, you'll notice that the, uh, you'll notice that the tanks, here we are. Here's an early one. Here's the tanks are not red there. The crane is up there. You were there the day that the crane came up, but I think there you saw I there was, was, but I really can't. I remember it was quite a production, but I can't really recall any great details about it. Okay. I remember putting the bus up there. I was off that day. I I, I just started working there, and it I, did happen in one day. Yeah, virtually. Like, we were like not we were not up on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in those days, and I'd worked on Monday, and I was off on Tuesday, and I came in on Wednesday, and here is this bus, you know. Mm. How did you? So they just brought the rigging over and put it up there. No, we had Bob had hired the crane rather. 
to lift the tower for the new rooftop elevator. Oh. And because we had it, we had the rental period was longer than the time we ended up needing it. So Bob wanting to do something with it. Don't let it go to waste. We had the school bus and which was constantly being shuffled around the parking lot or yeah. over to the Del Mar. Is it Del Mar? I remember. And uh, Bob said Bob had the idea we that about lifting the bus up on the roof and we had this high there's a hydraulic gimbal underneath it that was originally intended to be able to tip the bus over the roof while people were on it. <laughs> we never came to use the hydraulic gimbal, but I remember it was like lunchtime or just after lunch, I think. I overheard Bob talking to Ricky about pulling the engine and drivetrain out of the bus so we could put it on the roof. At and, lunchtime. And he asked Ricky, can you have that ready to go? you know, early tomorrow, and Ricky's like, sure. Of course, because Ricky and, gets uh, things done. Then, sure enough, the bus went up next day. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I hadn't been there that long, and I pulled up, and at that time, we didn't park in the parking lot for some reason. We parked on the street, and I looked up and went, I think we probably that? paid more fines for no permit on the bus than any all the fines City Museum ever paid. That was an issue for a long time. That was, you know, what I there were there were editorial cartoons and whatnot about the bus and the post dispatch and everything else. Yeah, but as our revenues grew, the city became more agreeable. I think. And true enough. True enough. There are a couple of different uh, cartoons about you know about the uh, inspe with the the inspector at his desk and and the phone is ringing off the hook and it says Bob Casley wants to do what now, you know. But it seemed to work out okay. So. So. That's a problem. What's next? Um, I don't know. I was just going to throw in here. Um, yeah, you kind of, you ended up painting a lot of things on the roof. And the bus is, is one of them. And the bus and the towers both are two things that you ended up painting that, mm -hmm. um, fortunately, I did not know that that's what was going on at the time. Because how did you paint the bus? I climbed up on it <laughs> with a bucket of paint and a roller and climbed out there and painted it. You were at least, like, secured, right? <laughs> well, I had a harness and a tether, but if I had fallen, the tether would, would have been so long, I'd have got beat up trying to retrieve me. Yeah, well, fortunately, that didn't happen. Needless to say, as, as the wife, I did not know this going on at the time, which is um, fortunate. You know, I will say, living, living and working in the same place, we became really good at separating um, work and home. And uh, it, most time during the day, we would never run into each other or anything. So I would not find out about these things until afterwards, fortunately, because that way I wasn't, you know, worried about things while they were going on. And, you know, it's human nature to worry. Um, so moving along. Speaking of human nature, so do you want to you wanna tell the fire story? Yeah, sure. Okay. So... <laughs> So, city museums had its share of fires over the years, right? But uh, one of our, one of our least, one of our most well-known ones was the uh, the the elevator the tower elevator burning. Tower. Mm -hmm. Hey, RP. What's up, Robert Paul? Okay, we're talking about the elevator fire right now, Maria. So this is a spectacular picture that I've recently come across from somewhere. Um, Tell us about the fire, baby. What went on? Well, we had put the tower up and put on the fiberglass panels and then uh, sprayed inside with insulating foam. So the fiberglass panels are molded, right? They were mold they were sculpted and molded, yeah? Am I yes. right about that? Okay. Yes. So there's sculpted and cast in fiberglass. Of them. Okay. So uh, the Foam had been sprayed, and it was supposed to be fire retardant foam. And we waited a couple weeks longer than what we were told the cure time would be. And there were uh, two tabs, or four tabs, on the tower that needed to be welded to plates that had been anchored in the shaft. And... Uh, uh, 
when the time came, Bob said, go ahead and let's get those plates welded in the tower. And I said, okay. So I went up there and I started welding and, and the foam seemed to burst into flames just from the UV light. Uh, not even, it just caught fire so easily. So wait a minute. So and where I went. Go ahead. Them. So you're inside the elevator tower. There's no elevator there, obviously. Standing on a two by 10. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and the two by 10 is secured how? It's anchored down, I suppose. Okay, good. Anyway, and so you... So I started welding and the foam caught fire in almost instantly. And I went and told Bob, uh, you know, I don't think that foam's ready. It's catching fire really easily. He said, all right, give it another week. And then uh, another week came and I, tried again and the same thing and I went one more time I told Bob and he said okay we'll give it one more week and uh, so at this point it is three weeks and that's kind of a long time for Bob to wait for something yeah well Bob was yeah I mean he was reasonable to want to get it done mm -hmm. anyway uh, so I tried again and this time I had a spotter I had fire extinguishers water and I'm out there welding and my spotter had left and I started welding and it caught in flames and I pulled my gloves off and stuffed them in this crack thinking, you know, okay, it's out now. And I, when I pulled the gloves out, it just, and it took me, I don't know, some number of minutes to get out of there and get away from it. But when I finally turned around it was fully engulfed in flames, and I was busy dragging oxyacetylene tanks across the roof to get them out of the way, which was no easy chore in that gravel. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, long story short, it all worked out okay. Uh, initially, the, sh the tower was clad entirely in fiberglass. There was no glass. The tower was so badly warped from the heat we had to take it down and rebuild it or straighten it and and stuff and then put it back up, I believe. Well, it's back up. So, I will tell you, so what Did was... Did we take it down? I think, I we, think so. I think and we I, had honestly, to take it down. Now that you say that, I think I have a picture of that. Because that was a whole summer job for Brent, I believe. Yeah, I think I had a picture of that somewhere and I didn't realize what I was looking at. Um, but I will tell you, hi, Lori. Hi, Dusty. Um, What's up, Dusty Bob? Anyway, I will tell you, so what was going on at the, at, at the, on, on the bottom while this fire was going on? It was a Friday, so because for a while, we only had Friday fires, you know? It was a five-alarm fire. Yes, it was. And I, I, I'm pretty sure it was August. And back in those days, we weren't that busy, but yeah, it was still it was a summertime It was a summertime Friday, so we were busy. So we had to, you know, get everybody out of the... Out of the um, uh, museum of course and move across the street as we do and we're watching all this fire going on so if it was put out I you know was coming back in on the, the Lucas side and there were all these pieces of charred fiberglass so being you know, the you know hoarder or hunter collector or you know natural archivist that I am I picked up pieces of this this charred fiberglass you know and I didn't really know you at the time I knew you as you know Someone that I... That guy you don't want to talk to. Right, which I never... Thank God Gene Steck told me that, you know, you were okay because I was too stupid to know the difference. And had I known that I wasn't supposed to talk to you, I might have not done so. But, you know, I didn't. I just thought you were the handsome, brooding one. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so later on, some months later, a month or so later, probably, anyway, I didn't know you were that well at the time, I gave him pieces of the... I had these little... They were like picture holders or something, but they were shaped like chairs. And there was one that was a flaming building chair. And so I put some pieces of the charred fiber plant <laughs> in it and gave them to you, um, which I thought was kind of a funny gift anyway. I mean. Can you tell we're starving to talk to people? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. 
So where I think where are we now, right. baby? Come on, um, people are going to get bored. You're right. Anyway, I don't know. I mean, I you know there are a million stories, but do we want to end up with that one? Do we want to leave off with that one? No, there's. Uh, you got more. Wait yeah, a minute. See, he's got what more. What else did we talk about? We talked. We talked about the beginning. We talked about we've talked about a little bit about living there. We talked about the uh, the. Um, Every day was an adventure, that's for sure. You got that right. Every day holds a surprise. Got that right. Um, well, there was the right. fire at Leonard's. How are we on time? We're about where we need to be. All right. Um, there was, yes, that was Not another... long before I, we moved from City Museum, I was coming home from the grocery store one night, and I'm walking across the second floor garage, and I believe it was Will from Housekeeping came running out of the vault room door and said, the aquarium is filled with smoke. I think it's on fire. And, and so, sure enough, I went in and I looked back there and it was filled with smoke. And I didn't have a key for the aquarium. I had to go upstairs to get that key. And I did so as fast as I could and I came back and it, the whole aquarium then was filled with thick smoke. And I opened a door and barged in there and back in one, where one of the tortoise pens was, uh, there were some heat lamps that were, the cords were stretched tight, irresponsibly tight, and that's another story. And anyway, that, one of them had shorted out and caught the bustios, the cypress knees that were in there caught fire. And so I put that out. It was plenty of water around. <laughs> yes, and then I put my groceries away. Yes, but you saved the, the, all the, the turtle lives, the, the tortoise lives, and the fish lives that night. It was, like a, it was a Sunday night, too, so it was a good thing we were there, because otherwise there could, that would have been... My, I could have, I guess, yeah. It could have been really ugly. Uh, there were a number of, of uh, fire stories, but... So the so the the fire the the rooftop fire was contained to the um, elevator shaft. Uh, the the yeah the rooftop fire it burned out really quick. I mean it I think it was smoldering in inside of fifteen minutes. That's that just was so fast. And then when the, there was another floor on the another fire on the tenth floor, not long after that, not long after that at all, in fact, uh, not too also long. On a no. Friday. <laughs> Uh, that involved cutting the soda cans that decorate the walls on the 10th floor, uh, the rubber and the stainless steel. We were using the table saw to cut them and the sparks and the rubber to us was a bad combination in the dust bin, so the table saw started fire, but that was not too big a deal. But it was another Friday and we did have to you just gotta think. Again. All you got to do is think about how far that sprinkler water travels down the building and that's how many floors you got to clean up. That's true. That's true. So we're just having a grand old time. <laughs> yes, we are. But I, th I don't know. I think, I, I, you know, can we save some for another time or do you have more? Um, no, I'm, I think I got it. All right. I'm good. All right. We'll save more for another time. I will tell you, I will, I will, I will leave one thing here. Um, another, yeah, that we did save the two-headed snake. Well, he, he did. I was still upstairs. That's um, true. Right. I will give you one, I will leave you with one more, uh, one more city museum gift. You know, I gave you the pieces of the charred fiberglass. One of the very first things you ever gave me was you were working in the caves. <laughs> and you were working in the caves. That's a good one, too. Yeah, and you came into the gift shop and said, close your eyes and put out your hands. So, you know, of course I did, because we had to put out my hands. And he puts into my hands a... a rat carcass, a petrified desiccated rat. Desiccated rat carcass. Or a, more like mummified rat in a z gallon Ziploc baggie. We were, we were just starting on cleaning out the shaft, and I had found this rat, and I gave... Brought it to he Stephanie. Gave it to me. <laughs> Fortunately, I thought it was, I thought it was hysterical. I actually I went I went and looked for it before this post because I, I do still have it, but I think it's actually put away. Nobody's with our, asking uh, questions. No, they never do. They never do. Boring. 
Maybe you're just mesmerized by our chatter or yammering. Here we go. What about the dog in the cage? Uh, oh, yeah. That's a good one. You can tell that one, baby. Well, you found a dog skull, but the dog in the... There is only one... There's a whole lot of creatures in City Museum, and most of them are, you know, aquatic or or naked we people or whatever. Magnet. But there is... Uh, right there. There's only one dog in, in the museum, and he is in the caves. You got a picture? Yeah. Well. Well, there's that sideways picture of him. Yeah, this is not a bad one. Anyway, there's a dog. There is one dog in the caves, do and uh, that dog is, is our dog Magnet, and she was Mark's dog Magnet first. Oh, yeah. Magnet, Magnet made yeah, a big difference in our lives, specifically in Mark's life, um, ours as well. But uh, I remember, I remember we being in the caves, walking in the caves with Bob, and him, and him saying, "That's." It's Mark Von Dysick's dog. <laughs> so, so, Magnet is the one dog in the museum. That's pretty m about 20 years ago, me and Magnet. Mm -hmm. Magnet was, there's, a, there's been a lot of city museum dogs, but uh, he is the one that is, well, actually the two, Pee Wee, the, the bones of Pee Wee, Bob's dog Pee Wee, are, are, are uh, in the cornerstone of the Tower. Anyway, we can ramble on. Go ahead. Pee Wee's the true city museum dog. Pee Wee, that's the truth. Pee Wee was something special. Okay, I got a little Pee Wee. So Pee Wee used to, I swear to you, and this happened more than once, the elevator doors would open, nobody would get off but Pee Wee. Pee Wee was a chihuahua. He would just get off by himself, kind of wander <laughs> around. Don't ask. I don't know. Anyway, we could go on forever like this, but, you know, again, it's, it's only... I don't know. We'll save more for later. Thanks for watching, everybody. It's been a treat. Um, I hope you enjoyed our show today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, everybody. All right. Till next Love week. Love you, family. You got that right. Everybody take care of yourself. Take care of each other. We're all in this together. Love you all. Bye. Bye-bye. Turn it off. <laughs>